Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a Michael Scott Plasma TV on his wall. He is the captain. That's right. Wanna be a baller, shot caller. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today I am pumped because we are featuring $1.29 tea by the brilliant women and men over at the Other Half Brewing Company in Brooklyn. Garage grade trumpets, please, five out of five bottle caps. I'm in love with Other Half right now. All of their stuff is fantastic. $1.29 tea is an Imperial India Pale Ale and 8.8% alcohol by volume. So crank up the volume and let's thank some of our good friends first up. Much love to Danielle, Tim, and Patrick in Buffalo, New York. Shout out to the Bills Mafia. And a big shout out to Marianne, where I went to high school, Greenville, South Carolina. And a big cheers to Christina in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Shout out to the Watchmen. I'm just going to name drop everybody. All right. Shout out to the Avengers. And a big shout to Michelle in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Here's a cheers to our friend Lisa in Cicero, New York. And last but certainly not least, we have a big cheers to our good friend Stacy S. in Parts Unknown. Everybody that we just mentioned, with the exception of the Bills Mafia, Avengers, and Watchmen, went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we are very grateful. We need to do another run of those Parts Unknown t-shirts. They were fabulous. For all of our merchandise, check out our store page. We have new black hoodies with the red logo and also Ohio, Team Ohio design. Check that out at truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. According to statistics reported to the FBI, 106 law enforcement officers were killed in line of duty incidents in 2018. Of these, 55 officers died as a result of felonious acts, and 51 officers died in accidents. FBI.gov cites 19 different circumstances in which the 55 officers were feloniously killed. Of those, Two officers were listed as killed while conducting traffic violation stops, and two others that were killed were involved in vehicle pursuits. So you can see, thankfully, this is a rare occurrence. This week, we take a hard look at a case that involves a traffic violation stop, a vehicle pursuit, and the murder of an officer. But this in the line of duty incident resulted in two deaths. And with much of the incident recorded via dash camera in the officer's police vehicle, why are we left with so many questions? The dash cam footage was later released on the internet, and on YouTube it has been viewed over 1.4 million times. This, no doubt, is an extremely tragic and horrific story. However, one would think this would be a simple open and shut case. But this is just not so. There is little doubt that bad behavior and bad blood was the fuel for murder. But does this true crime story have a hero? Or was there more than one murderer at this crime scene? And was the fallen officer a good cop, a bad cop, or possibly an evil man with a badge? Hey 
It was a cold, dark, snowy night in late January 2003. This in New Hampshire, when Franconia Police Corporal Bruce McKay was driving his usual patrol route. When he spotted an older model white Subaru in the parking lot at the entrance of the Fox Hill Park. Now, special note here, this is an area that is surrounded by woods. The Subaru was parked, engine off, and the lights off. It appeared to be abandoned. McKay called in the license plate and learned that the car belonged to a Michelle Kenny. McKay got out of his vehicle and approached the Subaru. He spotted a young man sitting inside with the driver's seat reclined all the way back. This was 19-year-old Leeko Kenny. He told Officer McKay that he was just waiting for some friends to come back from a Super Bowl party. Then Leeko started the engine and asked the officer for his name. At this, Officer McKay requested that Leeko hand over his driver's license and that it was the last normal thing that happened in this confrontation, which is viewable in its entirety thanks to the dash cam video and audio, which is available online. Yeah, there's three videos or three parts to this arrest, and then there's another video. I will post all four of those videos on our website at truecrimegarage.com. This is January 26, 2003 at 8.39 p.m. if the dash cam clock is correct. And on the first video, the audio starts at 1 minute and 12 seconds. So when Officer McKay requested Lico's license, Lico initially refused to hand it over. He wanted to know why the officer wanted it. He became combative and belligerent almost immediately, arguing with the officer, challenging McKay's authority to take his license, demanding that the officer's flashlight not be shined in his face, maintaining that he was allowed to sit in a public place, undisturbed by police. Officer McKay finally got the license and took it back to his cruiser to run it. When he saw the name on the license, Officer McKay said, quote, Oh, I was wondering why you had such an attitude. End quote. Clearly, the name on the license was one familiar to the officer. According to the book Bad Blood, McKay knew this family by reputation. Let's listen to a couple of audio clips from this initial rest in 2003. Catherine, I do know my rights. Surname of Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y. First of Lico, L-I-K-O. Middle people, and as you can tell, I'm Kenny. Five, five, You don't have that authority. 
I don't have the authority to tell someone not to put their hands on me. Not as a police not officer, in this no. Country? You have a Why requirement to comply. Why police officer go down the street beating kids up? You just go. This next clip is from part two of the arrest in 2003. Back in the car. I'm requesting police Get back in the car. Get back in the Can car. Get assistance. back. Can I request, look, I have white sensitive eyes. Can you not shine the light in my Get eyes? Get back in the Can car. Please have an officer come here to help me. They're, in res they're responding. How long go back go? inside. I have to be somewhere. As okay. long as it Can takes. Can I please have an officer's assistant? Can I call? You escalated this. No. I, you took my license. I asked you what your name was. You came back to my car. You took my license. Yep. I asked you when I could have my license back. You wouldn't tell me when I could have my license back. All I asked you was when can I have my license back. You wouldn't give me my license back. You still won't. Now you're preventing me from leaving. I have to be back with my mom's car. You're preventing me from leaving. You have my license right there. Why don't you give me my license and let me go home instead of doing this? Why don't you give me police assistance? I'm requesting police assistance. Do you not hear me? Can I please have some police assistance? You're torturing me. Why are you torturing me? Why are you tormenting me? What are you doing? Why are you harassing me? Can't you go arrest a drunk leaving the bar or something? Why? Why bother me? All I asked you was when could I have my license back because I have to get somewhere by a certain time. Why are you harassing me? Are you denying me police assistance? I'm requesting that you turn off the light that's in my eyes, and I'm requesting police assistance. At this point, Bruce McKay's backup shows up, and they're going to arrest Liko. Hello? Can I please get some assistance? This officer here is harassing me. He won't answer any of my questions I've been asking him. He took my license. Put your hands on the car. No. Why are you doing this? Put your hands on the car. What are you doing? Get away. Do not touch me. Do not touch me. I don't trust this officer. Please keep him away from me. I, he's been very threatening. He's put his hands on me. All I've asked him is to return my license. Please, okay. please don't touch me. Look, look, I haven't done anything. Look, no, stop touching me. Please stop touching me. Not touching me. Let go of me. Let go of me. Wait up. Ah, my neck. I'm just broken neck. Ah, you're hurting my head neck. Stop touching me. Get Let down. go of me. Stop resisting. What are you doing? Stop resisting. Let go of me. Why 
I didn't even, why are you doing this to me? I asked for police assistance and you came and threw me to the ground. I need help from the doctor. I asked him for his name and he wouldn't respond. I asked him what he was doing. He wouldn't tell me what he was doing. Well, that's fun on the old ears. What we hear here, Captain, I think we need to do a little breakdown because we just played a couple of clips. It's it's l- very lengthy if we were to play the whole thing. Hey, <laughs> stop molesting me. And it's a lot of a lot of back and forth, a lot of annoying yelling, but you can hear how this whole thing is escalating as we go through it. So basically what you have here, Captain, at the start of this is Lico he's not content to sit in his car while his license is being run. So he gets out of his car. He goes over to officer McKay's police vehicle. Now, well, it, let's take us one step back because when he initially, when officer McKay goes up to Lico's car right away, I think Lico is going to challenge the officer by saying, well, what's your name? Who are you? You have to prove yourself to me. I think that is the the match that got lit that started the whole thing. And I think at that point, the officer said, well, I have a right. And it's my job to make sure people are safe. And this is a vehicle parked in a public area late at night. No lights on. They're allowed to run your uh, information. So take it away from there. Well, on that note, I'm curious, you know, where he says, Lico says, I have the right to be sitting here. It's a public place. I I get that from his standpoint. I'm on board with Lico there where my first question goes. And I know this varies by area, by state and often even by County. So I'm not up to speed on this current situation here but he's at the entrance of a park Mm -hmm. and I know here in Franklin County, Delaware County, most Ohio counties, the parks close at dusk. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be there. So that in itself is suspicious behavior. So officer McKay may be right in his statement of, Hey, you're in a suspicious place at a suspicious time. Right. But I also think it's, it's bigger than that too. Let's say you're right outside this park that's closed. Most officers are not going to care, but they stop and they see you there and they go, okay, well, let me just approach the vehicle. Hey, what are you doing here? Once you get that kickback of what's your name, who are you? What right do you have to talk to me? I think as an officer, to me, I'd be suspicious of that person then. Well, why are they so combative? I'm just trying to see why they're parked here. So if they're going to be combative with law enforcement, maybe they have a reason to be combative with law enforcement. So I need to look up this individual to see if he has any warrants uh, to see, if, you know, who this individual is. Yeah. And the, the big issue I have immediately is the, you know, what I was getting at is, is Lico getting out of his vehicle and approaching the officer's vehicle. That's a big no, no, Mm -hmm. no officer wants to see that during a traffic stop. So, and, or, or whatever you want to call this, even if he's just checking, maybe who, who knows, maybe McKay went up there with the idea that he was going to offer some type of assistance or right just to see if the vehicle was abandoned there for any number of reasons. And you're right. The, the match was lit and I believe the the match was lit by Lico in the beginning, but I'm, I'm a little shocked here that, and I really want to encourage everybody to go and watch this for yourself because I don't want anybody sitting there going, well, you guys were too easy on the officer or too hard on Lico or too hard on the officer. Because I think that, that my opinion of the, of each is behavior of each of these individuals' behavior, at the end of the day, I'm not not 100% happy with either one of them. No, it's almost like they're pushing each other's buttons. Yeah, like like they're st- like between them is a fire, and they each have a gas can, and they're just they're just tossing a little bit on it as they go. And and part of me sees we don't know what the officer went through that day. We don't know how many 
um, you hear this a lot from officers is that they start having a disdain for people in general only because they're normally dealing with the worst of the worst. They're not getting to deal with just the regular citizen every minute of every day. They're getting calls out to uh, domestic violence, dr- drugs, all that stuff, drunk drivers. So, but he he goes, this kid is now pushing his buttons. Obviously, like you said, you pointed out, this name means something. And I don't think it's Lico that means something. I think it's, I think it's Kenny that means something to, to Bruce McKay. Right. And I actually think that McKay, maybe not 100% of the time, but I think most of the way he handled this as best he could. You know, I think we have a situation where Lico challenges him right away and then Lico approaches his vehicle, the police vehicle, while he's running the license. And then we have another situation where eventually Lico gets back in his car and attempts to drive off. And you hear right, Officer, right. Officer McKay can be heard telling dispatch that the subject turned hostile and was attempting to leave the scene. Well, yeah, two things right there. One, the approaching the vehicle, getting out of your car, approaching the officer. Big no, no, no. That Don't do that. Getting in your car and then moving it around and having the the cop have to get in their car and, and maneuver in a way so you can't get out. Big, big no-no, right? Those those two things are big no-nos because the officer has to think about his safety, but he also has to think about the safety of this individual. Well, but, I- but, but I would also argue that before any of this, there are maneuvers uh, or tactics or protocols that he could – of used being McKay could have used to dis deescalate the situation a little bit. Like, Hey, just sit in your car. Don't worry about it. If, if you're not doing anything wrong, let me just run your license and I'll get it right back to you and you'd be on your way. So you're now giving the person that you pulled up, you didn't pull over, but you approached, you don't have a real reason to arrest them but you have at least cause to figure out who they are, but just give that in. You can give that individual some direction. I'm going to take your information. I'm going to see if there's any warrants. If there's no warrants, I'm going to send you on your way. You know, you Mm. just can't sit here. And the reason why is the park is closed. So the entrance is closed as well. And then you let, you let the person go. I just don't see any, attempt from McKay to de-escalate the situation. Yeah, I mean, it appears McKay is is content to leave Lico in the dark, let's say, about as to what is going to happen next. Right. Um, I mean, he did tell him a hundred times to get back in his vehicle. Yeah. And then later we have Lico complaining, hey, I have sensitive eyes, you're shining the light in my eyes. Well, uh, dude, you turned your car around and you are facing my headlights now, right? You know, before, and it, look, this, this is complete police protocol. This is how any traffic stop is going to take place at that time. When it's dark out, they're going to keep their lights on the back of your vehicle to make sure you're not pulling a gun out of the glove box or from underneath the seat. Yeah. But a f- few things, Hey, Lico, I'm going to show you respect. You show me respect. Right. I'm going, this is what we're doing. Uh, I think Bruce wanted to act differently, obviously, but he is, he's under watch. You got the dash cam plus you have the audio. Um, so I think this was his way of winning, but he had to remain calm. He had to watch what he said. Um, but again, I think there was, there's simple tactics he could have done to, to, Put a little water on the fire instead of putting gasoline on the fire. What what would you have used in that situation? Gasoline. I would have just lit the car no, I on mean, fire. What, what tactics would you have used to, to de-escalate? This? Well, like I said, I think the first thing is just letting the Lico know that I'm going to check to see if you have a record. And if you don't, I'm going to send you on your way and, and the, and explain why I have the right to, 
to check your information. Um, and then also, I think, Liko, if you're not going to be cooperative, I am going to call for backup, and we will arrest you. Um, I think that's also letting the person know, hey, if you comply with me, I'm going to let you go. You're not going to be in trouble. But you keep this up, it's going to end in our, you're going to be in jail. So I think that a couple of those things might have calmed the situation. Yeah. I just wish Liko would have complied with McKay at some point. Because we have Liko asking for another officer on the scene, and McKay complies with that. So well, I think, and then on a, top I of think that, in a give and take situation, I see one individual taking and not giving. Well, and like we said, he, he goes from asking for assistance and then asking to be let go. And it's, you know, he, and he's obviously being completely rude and disrespectful. And then when you hear their arrest, you know, at some point, you know, McKay is saying, you know, Liko grabbed his balls and the, it's a, it's resisting arrest. I mean, once you get to that point and maybe it's not uh, a law for a, arrest but once it gets to that point and you start resisting they have to do everything in their power to protect themselves at that point you don't matter if your arm gets smashed a little bit if they have to put your face in the ground a little bit that's what's going to happen and that and we have given these individuals the right to do that so once he starts yelling oh you're molesting me you're breaking my arm my hurt neck you know it's like you know grow up kid you, yeah, so you, you you got it. you kept throwing gasoline on the fire. You kept on poking the bear. You know, eventually you mess with the bull, you're going to get the horn. Well, and if if anybody wants to scream brutality here, um go for it, but that wouldn't be the hill that I would want to die on because from me viewing this so let's go through this real quick. When when the backup officers arrived, they did approach Liko, who was now standing off camera. They physically seized him. He can be heard yelling for a while that the group, you know, the group appears in the video frame just for a brief minute. But it does take the three officers, three officers to wrestle Liko down to the ground. This is behind his car and now out of the view of the dash cam. Liko screaming the whole time. You heard some of that. He's screaming that they're hurting him. He yelled over and over about his neck being broken by the cops, which we know didn't happen. Well, he, no, he was yelling, I, I got a hurt neck. You're hurting my neck. At one I, point, he says they, they they broke my neck. Right, because he's acting like an idiot. The problem I have here with these officers is you know that you're on dash cam. You know that this guy, you're, you're coming to the scene because one officer cannot handle this individual and now you have three of you just arrest him in front of the car so we can see it on camera i don't think that was an option though i think they're reacting to this individual possibly not you you, you possibly could be I, I mean i i think in i think in a perfect world they they would very likely have wanted to have no. full view of the arrest itself because uh, here, here's what I see. Anybody that wants to scream brutality, watch the video, have your own opinion. You don't have to believe me. What I see here is that if these three officers wanted to beat the shit out of this kid, they, they could have. They had the opportunity to do so, and it does not appear to me from the information I've reviewed that they did that. It looks to me like they simply made an arrest. Right now, it's so important that we avoid crowds anywhere that we can. But what if you need to go to the post office? What if you need postage to send out letters and packages? Don't worry. Stamps.com is here to help. Anything that you can do at the post office, you can do at Stamps.com. And trust True Crime Garage when we tell you we've been using Stamps.com for years. You personally print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, for anywhere then just drop it off in the mailbox you don't have to stand in line at the post office whether you're a small business sending invoices or an online seller shipping out products or you're just working from home and you need to mail stuff stamps.com can handle it all with ease 
With stamps.com, you get great discounts. 5% off every first class stamp and up to 40% off USPS shipping rates. And now stamps.com also offers UPS services with a discount up to 62%. You won't even have to pay UPS residential surcharges. Stamps.com is a must for any small business owner. Right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in garage. That's stamps.com and enter our promo code garage. Stay safe, my friends, and check out stamps.com today. All right. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers to you, Captain. Real quick, I just want to say this. When I was playing all over the state and traveling a lot real early in the morning to get back home, you know, sometimes going through these small towns at 4 or 5 a.m., only car on the road, you'd get pulled over a lot more than you think you should. Oh, yeah. And I kept feeling like I was being harassed. And having a police officer, then later a detective as a father, asking him for some advice on this. Hey, I keep getting pulled over. I'm not doing anything wrong. Sometimes I don't even know why they're pulling me over. And I feel like I'm being harassed. And he st- just said to me simply, hey, yes, sir. No, sir. That goes a long way. So when the officer would approach, you know, can I see your uh, license and registration? Yes, sir. You know, yes, sir. No, sir. goes a long way. Yeah. And I, I believe you to be right on all ends of that, that story because it's weird. And I think it's just like a country thing to get pulled over just because you're driving. <laughs> I mean, right. it was like that happened to me plenty of times. And, 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 you know, I did the yes, sir, no, sir thing too. Uh, because I always wanted, I always believed whether it be at, sitting in the principal's office or at a traffic stop or anything like that, if you show a little bit of respect and just, it, it will end up being better for the both of us at the end of the day. Well, hopefully. And, and if not, look there, look there, sometimes there's just bad people out there and, yes. and no, sir. And yes, sir, is not going to matter a lick of difference. That's right. But for most cops, it, it really does matter. You you showing them a, a sign of respect, showing them that you um, are, are compliant in everything they're doing. Also, know your rights as a citizen. Um, but the you know, look at this case in particular. The actions of Lico are so immature Mm -hmm. that it'd be hard to side with him. Even if he's in the right, he, he is in the right on a lot of things. It's the attitude in which he presents it. Yeah. And in almost the constant nagging behavior and attitude of Lico. And if, if at any point you watched the video or you heard our clips and you kind of chuckled to yourself, I felt guilty about that because I did as well. I don't think you you need to feel guilty for that because it's just it's so absurd. And the longer you listen to it, the the behavior is so absurd that I think that's how you kind of manage hearing what you're hearing. And one absurd part, one one part that I found to be a little bit this is maybe some sarcastic humor. I don't think anybody was trying to make this uh, a humorous portion of the story. I found it humorous was where officer McKay can be seen and heard speaking into his shoulder, mic, saying, quote, there's going to be a complaint from the arrested party. Right. And you, you hear that and you see him call that in and you're like, well, no kidding, no kidding. There's going to be a complaint before we go too much further here. Captain, a lot of the information we relied on in this case came from two major sources. One of them being John Sedgwick's, 2007 Boston Magazine article entitled Collision Course, rightfully entitled Collision Course. The other was the book Bad Blood, Freedom and Death in the White Mountains by Casey Sherman. So let's 
get into the aftermath a bit of this 2003 Leeko Kenny arrest. Well, because a lot of listeners right now are going, this is a simple arrest. What's, what's the big deal? Garage guys. Right, right. So as you just said, why would we be discussing this confrontation? It hardly merits discussion on True Crime Garage. Right. What we're going to see is this confrontation between Officer Bruce McKay and Leeko Kenny was just the beginning of a hostile relationship, one that would have fatal consequences. So McKay filed a report about the arrest of Leeko Kenny. His depiction of the events was partially confirmed by the dash cam video. As Boston Magazine put it, Leeko was the one who, quote, turned heated and combative. According to McKay's report, in the course of McKay and the other officers wrestling a belligerent, hostile Leeko to the ground, Leeko grabbed McKay's groin and began squeezing. Mm -hmm. In response, Officer McKay applied quote, lawful defensive force by engaging in a protective maneuver to successfully release Kenny's grip from by striking the left side of Kenny's face. But Lico's story was different. Lico said later that Officer McKay had kicked him in the head and used unnecessary force. Lico was taken in handcuffs to the hospital and was evaluated to to be to determine the extent of the actual injuries. Right. He had accused the officers of hurting his neck, arms, and legs, but the evaluation revealed no injuries except some swelling around his jaw, presumably where Officer McKay had struck him. No broken neck. No broken neck. Hmm. It's a miracle. Uh, police searched the Subaru and Wait, found... Wait, hold on. Was there any um, evidence of molestation? <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. That was none was listed in the report. Mm. So police searched the Subaru Lico's car, found a glass pipe and marijuana residue under the seat, uh, found four 22 caliber casings and two knives that were in Lico's pockets during the entire encounter. So to be clear, he didn't have a gun. The two knives he had, I I'm always a little, hesitant on the knife situation you know some people make a big deal this person had a knife a lot there are a lot of people that carry knives a lot especially in the country uh because they use them for as a tool right so i don't see anything wrong with the knives and given his age and maybe this is partly why mckay went up and walked up to the vehicle in the first place given Lico's age it's not really su- surprising to find a pipe with some leftover marijuana residue in the vehicle. I mean, that doesn't shock you, does it there, Captain? No, and I don't think it's that big of a deal. So, Lico was charged with assaulting McKay and released into his parents' custody on $2,000 bail. His bail agreement required that he not possess any weapons. This is going to lead us to a situation that takes place in April of the same year, still 2003. So, Lico's bail agreement, still in effect, as he awaited the legal proceedings on the assault charge. Lico, Lico's uncle called the cops on him for trespassing. Lico's uncle Bill reported that his nephew was riding his ATV on his property, and Lico was told time and time again that this was not allowed. One of the responding officers was Bruce McKay. So McKay busted Lico for violating his bail agreement because when the cops found him, he had a blow gun and steel darts in his possession. In fact, McKay filed a report stating the weapon qualified as the type of dangerous weapon prohibited by Lico's bail agreement. As a result, Lico was subjected to house arrest. And because Lico was a royal pain in the ass, he cut off his ankle bracelet. Right. That was issued to him by the courts. Well, that's not good, Bob. Nobody, you know, you don't approach the police vehicle during a traffic stop. You don't cut off your ankle bracelet that's issued to you by the courts. Yeah, you don't get in your car and try to go around the officer. You don't go on somebody's property, even if it's your uncle's property when you were told not to. You don't carry, 
Look, if you're on probation, you might carry around a knife because that's what you use as a tool. But it's against your probation, so you don't carry around anything. Well, and cutting off the ankle bracelet, that's a great way to earn yourself a nice stay at the county jail. Yeah. Which it did. Lico got 15 days in jail. I do want to note here that there was a lot of buildup between Lico and his uncle before the uncle called the police about the trespassing. Yeah, because the uncle probably doesn't want to throw his nephew in jail or get his nephew in trouble. Well, and I think it got very dangerous between the two of them because the the uncle was definitely doing some things to upset Liko, and Liko was upsetting his uncle. What happened before, there was a situation just before this situation where he calls in the police. This is terrifying. Apparently, Liko cut down a tree. This was a 40-foot pine tree, and it conveniently fell on the uncle's home. So very dangerous situation here. And And now Rico is in 15 days in jail. Yeah. Ultimately he would plead guilty to the charges of the, the assault charges of the officer and resisting arrest. He was sentenced to 12 months, but would only end up doing 15 days. This is the 15 days that he was in jail already. So time served. This is after, and this, this might shock some people out there who have reviewed this case, but this is something that I found. This was after Officer McKay requested that Lico be treated with leniency. Now, this was according to, to be clear, this was according to New Hampshire state officials. So I, you take that for what it is, but that's where that came from. No, that's, I mean, but that's, again... I think when you look at the initial arrest, it's a officer that's, you know, he's, he's having to reserve himself because he is being recorded. But at the same time, it's like, we can sit there and say, you say no, sir. And yes, sir, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes you're just like, there's good cops and bad cops. Sometimes there's just some dumbass teenagers and, and we've all had dumbass teenager moments. I've had them. I know you've had them, and I won't go into those on the show because I don't want to embarrass you in front of all your friends. Oh, I thought you were talking to the listeners. <laughs> uh, the judge did order, this is interesting, the, the judge ordered that Lico was to have no direct or indirect contact with Officer Bruce McKay. Let's step aside just for a minute here and learn a little bit about Lico Kenny and his family. So Liko, which means bud in the native Hawaiian language, is the son of Davy Kenny and his wife, Michelle. The Kenny clan was rather large. Liko's grandparents, Jack and Peg, moved to the Easton Valley of New Hampshire in the 1950s, buying a 450-acre parcel of land. There, in 1962, they founded the famous rustic Tamarack Tennis Camp where kids from all over the Northeast would come to train. The extended Kenny clan all had houses on this large property. The family was known in the area for being, quote, adventurous and headstrong. This was as described by the New York Times. And fiercely free-spirited, as described by Boston Magazine. In fact, these descriptions seem a little forgiving, to be honest with you. The Kennys were aggressive, brash, and wild. All of them seemed to be talented athletes with no fear and big chips on their shoulders. They didn't get into legal trouble so much as suffer physical tragedies as a result of their impulsive and headstrong behavior. For example, Bubba Kenny. uh, This is Liko's uncle, not, not the one that he ends up in trouble with. He was a talented skier who was known for his daredevil stunts, like free diving off of bridges. He died in a kayaking accident at the age of 25. A different uncle of Lico's, Uncle Mike, raced professionally as a skier and then became a coach for the U.S. ski team. And you may have heard of Lico's cousin, Bodie Miller. He's a famous U.S. Olympic ski racer. Now, Lico's parents split their time between the Tamarack tennis camp in the summer 
and Hawaii in the winter. Davey and Michelle were the hippie types. They homeschooled Liko and taught him that freedom and independence were paramount. It's appropriate that they lived in New Hampshire, the state whose slogan is live free or die. Liko, in other words, was raised to believe he could do whatever he wanted. The book Bad Blood tells us that Liko had problems with anger from a very young age. In one incident as a toddler, he tried to stab a friend who took his toy. One lifetime friend described Liko as a psychopath and said, if you went on a hike with him, you were never sure if you were going to come back. Liko was so unpredictable that he was actually banned from his family's tennis camp while campers were around. And he terrorized his little sister to the point that when she left to go away for college, she vowed never to come back as long as Liko was around. Yeah, it almost seems like he has some kind of mental disorder. I almost wonder if this is something that would have, that, that went undiagnosed that they may have discovered later. Right. Now, Liko flunked out of school. This after being diagnosed with dyslexia. He had no job prospects as a young man. He was described as smart, but Liko was frustrated with his failures and his lack of opportunities. And his anger continued to build. This was compounded by major feelings of insecurity. One of Liko's best friends named Siri Hayward told his father about Liko, saying, quote, he's going to get in trouble or hurt, or he's going to hurt someone else, end quote. Siri was killed in in an auto accident in 2005 and another friend was killed that same year and Liko really started to become unhinged after the deaths of his two friends he was disappearing into the woods and saying he needed to talk to Siri who who's now dead and mumbling that something was going to happen now Uncle Bill he's the one that got into it with Liko now, in Liko's defense, Bill had a schism with the rest of his family, with everybody. A schism? A schism. Mm. The grandparents deeded the entirety of the property, remember it's 450 acres, to all five of their children together, meaning that they legally owned the property as a group and had equal rights to all of it. Right. But Uncle Bill, who was a survivalist, organic farmer, and so-called eco purist as described by Boston magazine, he succeeded from the family and sued for ownership rights of a specific parcel, one fifth of the land. So he could live the way he wanted to. This apparently meant, meant alone in a log cabin for 30 years. <laughs> he just didn't like his family. Well, it gets, it gets crazier, man. Uncle Bill one day decides he wants a wife. So mm. he got a wife named Larissa from Kyrgyzstan. Don't make me say that again because I said it wrong the first time. Kyrgyzstan. A Central mm. Asian country. This, this is like a mail order bride. Via a website. I don't know the name of a website by which men can import a woman to marry them. Well, how about we just take a minute? You let me know what that website was. Well, I do a little side note here. Please don't send me any hate mail. I did not create the website, nor have I purchased any people. So not yet. You know, reading consumer reports regarding the purchase of people. It turns out they're a waste of money. Don't do it. So, <laughs> all right, let's talk about officer Bruce McKay. Now that we know who the Kenny family is, the Kenny clan, as I call them, McKay was born in Bronxville, New York in 1958. He attended a private prep school where he played lacrosse and was captain of the soccer team. He worked as a lifeguard at the local beach. He was described as handsome, popular. He was a do-gooder who lived life on the straight and narrow. He attended New England College in New Hampshire and worked as a volunteer fireman an EMT before attending a 12-week law enforcement training course at the New Hampshire Police Academy. After graduating, he landed a part-time job on the force in Haverhill. Listeners will recognize this as Mara Murray territory. Then in 1996, 
He was offered a position as the third full-time officer in nearby Franconia. He was divorced with a young daughter. He was engaged to be married to Sharon Davis. Their wedding was scheduled for July of 2007. But that, Captain, is where the facts end. The rest of what we know about Bruce McKay differs radically depending on the source. Some say he was a bully on a power trip. Others say he was a dedicated cop who was committed to the rule of law and was a credit to his profession. According to Boston Magazine, the Franconia 1000 residents generally preferred not to have any government interference in their lives. And they also preferred not to have to toe the line with regard to pesky rules and regulations. Their live and let live mentality does not mesh well with that of a police officer who sees things in black and white and is committed to enforcing the laws. Right. Like Bruce McKay. McKay reportedly was responsible for over 300 traffic stops in 2006. The other two officers in town had a combined total of 11. 300 to 11. Yeah. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. McKay seemed out to get the citizens of this area for every infraction, no matter how small. The vanity plate on his personal vehicle, a Nissan SUV, read gotcha. <laughs> Got him. Yeah. According to Boston Magazine, McKay once pulled over a 79-year-old woman for an expired registration sticker. After she tried to explain that she was heading home to cook dinner for her husband, apparently he made her wait in the car for two hours. Hmm. Bad blood well, hey, rules are rules, man. <laughs> right. Bad blood sheds a little bit of different light on these aspects of Bruce McKay. According to the book quote, rarely did he let his feelings get in the way of police work to McKay. The law was the law and it applied equally to everyone in his little corner of the world. He would hand a friend, a speeding ticket as quickly as he would a stranger. Yeah, see, I, I just don't agree with that, especially like elderly lady. It's like, tell her, hey, get that taken care of. Be on your way. The book goes on to say that the black and white attitude rubbed many folks the wrong way, but others appreciated the fact that McKay didn't play favorites. Yeah. So there were residents who supported McKay. Some said he was a nice guy and a great cop. The, the ones that weren't arrested. <laughs> right. The police chief said McKay was an outstanding officer who was awarded 30 commendations during his years of service. Yeah, but they also have a quota. And, and some, of, some of the funding for these departments come from the tickets that the, that the citizens have to pay. Well, others obviously felt different. In fact, according to some of the articles we looked at, complaints from town residents about Officer McKay, this was not uncommon. There were nine complaints filed against McKay during his 11-year tenure. Some believed McKay would rely on using force too often during the course of performing his duties. I've reviewed the ones that I could find and will say, in my humble garage opinion, the overwhelming majority of these quote, use of force incidents were justified, but not all of them. Some are cause for debate. One in particular was the arrest and pepper spraying of college student Sarah Emberly. The dash cam footage of this encounter is available online as well. This incident has mixed reviews, some people believing that McKay unnecessarily escalated things and some believe that he was totally within his rights to spray the young woman. In 2005, a fellow officer, this is Mark Taylor, wrote a letter to the police chief. And the letter says, based on my previous knowledge of Corporal McKay's demeanor, this matter of fact attitude can come across as hostile and confrontational. And he advised McKay to be less confrontational. Shall we get back to Lico here, Captain? Yeah. 
Okay, so now we're at January of 2003. This is when Lico got himself a handgun. This was a high point 45 caliber gun. According to his family and friends, he adored this gun, shooting it into the air at parties and sleeping with it under his pillow. But in January of 2007, the gun disappeared from his room. Lico knew who took it. It was his 15 year old cousin. Lico suspected this because the same cousin took Lico's PlayStation the previous year. Lico confronted the teen cousin and things quickly got physical. Lico apparently strangling the kid and threatening him during the course of this encounter. To be clear, he didn't kill him. He, he just, I mean, but it shows how out of control the situation got. Now, this method of theft investigation didn't work for Lico. And he was unable to get the gun back. So he called the state police and reported it stolen. The officer dispatched by the stateies got the teenage cousin to confess to taking the gun. But the cousin also reported that Lico had violently attacked him. And this was witnessed by other family members. Lico told the officer that he had just shook him a bit. The state trooper was required to file an assault complaint against Lico, and a trial was scheduled for April 24th of 2007. This would be Lico's second trial for assaulting someone, the first being Officer McKay in 2003. At this trial, the cousin and Lico's grandmother testified against Lico. And before this trial went down, Lico, ever the charmer, threatened members of the young cousin's family, telling them that if the cousin and his grandma testified against him, he would kill them. Despite all of this misbehavior, Lico was only ordered to pay a $250 fine. After the conviction, Lico really started to unravel. Lico told his boss at his job this is at Agway Supermarket, that he felt like he was being followed. He told others that the cops were out to get him and that Officer McKay was hunting him. He started to isolate himself and write about his, quote, last days. This was in his daily planner. His parents were still in Hawaii at this time, but his extended family began to be concerned that Lico would commit suicide. With the paranoia, you start, again, wondering about the mental health of Lico. I do want to point out, too, that something that might add to this whole thing here, Captain, being the, let's say, evaluation by others of Lico at this time, there were several persons that reported that he was pretty much living by himself for months and months and months leading up to what I would call the final confrontation. Right. And we know, at least it's my belief, that if somebody is potentially suffering from something or going through something, being alone for an extended period of time usually doesn't seem to help the situation. Yeah, it makes it worse. Right. So you just wonder what he was going through. Now, the book Bad Blood details a memo that Officer Bruce McKay circulated to his fellow officers after Lico's trial. This memo was titled Officer Safety Notice and informed officers of Lico's conviction and states that Lico attempted to influence the witnesses at the trial, the other members of 